in this episode of Plants of the Gods. Join ethnobotanist Mark Plotkin in conversation with Brian Morescu, author of the New York Times bestselling book, The Immortality Key. From the golden age of classical Greece, to the birth of Christianity, to the pagan continuity hypothesis, Morescu and Dr. Plotkin ponder the role psychedelics have played in Western civilization in the first of a two-part episode. Welcome back to Plants of the Gods. Today we have a very special guest, a man I'm honored to call a friend and a colleague, and that's Brian Morarescu, who wrote the classic book, The Immortality Key, which I regard as the most important book in the field of ethnobotany, perhaps since the original Plants of the Gods. Let me start out by quoting a review I wrote of the book once it appeared. Reading Brian's wonderful book, The Immortality Key, reminded me, oddly enough, of the Back to the Future movie trilogy of the late 1980s, and I mean that in the most positive sense possible. The Back to the Future films were genre benders, which started out to be a simple teen coming-of-age comedy, quickly morphed into science fiction, action-adventure, western rom-com with a brilliant nod to high school musicals and a sustained swipe at a certain American president. The Immortality Key unfolds in a similar way. What appears to be a straightforward investigation into the origins of Christianity becomes a detective story searching for an explanation into the famed Eleusinian mysteries of ancient Greece, as well as the righting of an academic wrong, a coming-of-age story, a roots-like search for the author's cultural origins, all told within the framework of a personal odyssey. And I say odyssey with a capital O. The author is an unlikely protagonist, an American lawyer who has never sampled entheogenic plants or fungi. However, he is a Greek-American, fluent in ancient Greek and Latin and Sanskrit, uh, with an incisive and inquisitive mind and the gift for quickly earning people's trust, which gains him access to archives and catacombs off limits to mere mortals like the rest of us. Brian, welcome to Plants of the Gods. (laughs) That's the best intro ever, man. Thank you, Dr. Plotkin. Now, Houston Smith, who is the greatest uh, historian uh, and analyst, I think, of religions in the 20th century, said, and I quote, if we take the world's enduring religions at their best, we discover the distilled wisdom of the human race. And so much of your work, Brian, in The Immortality Key is distilling what is at the root of Western religions and maybe world religions. So perhaps you can share with our listeners a bit about the Eleusinian mysteries and the role in the development of where we stand today. Sure. So for for those who don't know, uh, Eleusis uh, still exists in one form or another. It's called Eleusina. Um, in uh, in today's world. And actually, next year, 2023, Elefsina, of all the places in Europe, has been nominated to be the European capital of culture. So this might all seem like weird anecdotes and footnotes that belong um, in an unread book, but Elefsina is back on the world map for one reason or another. Um, in antiquity, Eleusis, I've, I've described as kind of like the Vatican of the ancient world. It's a few miles northwest of Athens. So during the classical period, so think, you know, 2,300, 2,500 years ago and more, um, for about 2,000 years, this was the place that people went. Men, women, sometimes children, slaves. Um, People were invited to Eleusis, if you could afford it and you had the time to make this pilgrimage, uh, to become immortal. That was the promise of Eleusis. You went to this place, amongst other things, to drink a potion called the Kukion, this magical potion, the recipe of which was secret. And you would go there, um, have uh, this experience that has since been described as the culminating experience of a lifetime. And Carl Ruck, uh, one of the professors who researched this at Boston University, described the experience as somehow making all previous seeing seem like blindness. So you went there to have a visionary encounter with goddesses, with, with, uh, with strange beings. They called them Demeter and Persephone, the lady of the grain and the goddess of death, the goddess of the underworld. Um, and it was claimed that only those who went to Eleusis, again, drank this potion, participated in the pilgrimage, would in fact achieve immortality. It was only they who would survive death. And we don't know what that means because it was all kept secret, but we do know that the best and brightest of both Greece and Rome visited Eleusis for about 2,000 years. And they went there, we think, to die and be reborn. Well, 
I can't think of any other book I've read on the history of religion which had parts that were laugh out loud funny. <laughs> but that is one of the special parts of the immortality key. And I really, really, really loved your discussion of the analysis of these classical scholars, the brightest people of their day, supposedly, trying to figure out what the hell went on in Eleusis. And at one point, uh, I think it was a fellow from Oxford or Cambridge said, well, it was giant puppets. <laughs> and you said, yeah, ancient Muppets. <laughs> so this was, uh, this was the, the type of humor which is often uh, missing in these types of clinical and historical analysis, but it's what makes the books so special. Now, one of the sad aspects of the story originally was this was brought to the Western world essentially in the 1970s, spearheaded by a man named Karl Ruck, who's still alive, a classic scholar, along with my uh, old friend Gordon Wasson and some other people. And the, the whole story of how Ruck was ridiculed and almost exiled because of this radical theory um, is very shameful, and I want to ask you to get into that. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I think it, it's important to point out that while these classical scholars were torturing themselves trying to figure out what the hell went on in Eleusis, uh, all of us hippies at the time were reading these accounts of these uh, classical leaders like Pindar and, and Sophocles and going, dude, they were tripping. It was obvious to us, even it wasn't obvious to the scholars. So in talking about death and rebirth, frame that in, in Karl Ruck's personal story since I think your book really brought him back to the fore. Oh, that's good. Wow. Good question. Yeah, so he went through his own death and rebirth as a kind of microcosm of this of this scholarship, which is interesting. So yeah, the, the idea that that dude, they were on psychedelics was not a popular theory in the late 1970s. So you mentioned uh, Carl and Gordon and Albert Hoffman was the, was the co-author, the, you know, the famed discoverer of LSD back in the 1930s. And together they wrote this book called The Road to Eleusis, Unveiling the Secret of the Mysteries in 1978. It was not well received by the academic establishment and least of all by the then president of Boston University, a guy named John Silber. Um, and Ruck was excoriated for, for daring to suggest that uh, the, the founders of rationality, right, of, of Western skepticism, that they could have entered so fully into such a, an irrational state of mind, um, and least of all through psychedelic drugs, which were also not popular in the late 1970s, just a few years into the war on drugs under Richard Nixon. Uh, so, you know, throughout the 80s and 90s, Carl... Um, and beyond. He was he was uh, relegated to the periphery of classical scholarship. I, I think in the book I call him the black sheep of the classics estate, um, a place, you know, you don't want to occupy. But he was tenured at Boston University, so they couldn't fire him. They couldn't get rid of him. Um, and instead of just quietly going about his, his way, he basically spent another 30, 40 years just continuing to pound away at this hypothesis. He wrote about other things, and he's a fantastic scholar, by the way, trained at Yale and Harvard. Uh, but he really went after this idea of the ancient Greeks, um, the Romans, and potentially the earliest Christians using these kinds of drugs uh, to, to um, instantiate these spiritual experiences. And you know, slowly but surely, the culture came back around to where it was in the 1950s, when this was all the realm of gentlemen's discourse. And so Carl went through his own rebirth um, only in, in, in recent years as some of the technology came on, the archaeobotany I write about in the book, the archaeochemistry, to really, really prove that, well, there's actual organic data to, uh, to test this hypothesis one way or the other. And so some uh, pretty interesting data came to light. Uh, shows this is a discipline worth visiting. And, and I think in, in coordination with some of the clinical work at places like Johns Hopkins and NYU, and now it's all over the place at Harvard and Yale and uh, UCLA, et cetera, um, even in Texas, uh, I think that, that the, the culture changed a lot in the past five, 10 years uh, with respect to psychedelics. And so fortunately, Carl, who's now 87, is experiencing yet another rebirth. Well, Plants of the Gods has as a subtitle, Hallucinogens, History, Culture, and Conservation. And I think your work, Brian, ties all four of those together. But my question to you is, why now? We have Ruck and Hoffman uh, coming out with this book decades ago. Uh, John Allegro's The Mushroom and the Cross, which postulated some similar things. And, and they were laughed at, derided, disregarded, ignored. 
And now, thanks to your book and, and other efforts, uh, this is part of the commonly accepted wisdom. Why are we accepting it now and why didn't we accept it then? I have no idea is the, is the honest answer. My, yeah, my, my life has taken a, a, a weird course the past two years. I think, uh, <clears throat> I, I mean, I alluded to it before. I, th- I think it's a lot of dumb luck, to be honest. I mean, I'm sitting across from somebody who spent a lot of his life researching this in, in, in earnest. Um, and you yourself standing on the shoulders of people like Richard Evan Schultes. Um, great ethnobotanist of the 20th century, who I know has been mentioned on this podcast before, deservedly so. Um, and then I don't, I don't know. I, just, I think the the culture war really got in the way, not just of the clinical work, but also the the arts and humanities and some of this this scholarship that was not controversial in the days of William James at Harvard. By the way, you know, more than a hundred years ago, uh, this this was a respectable avenue of of pursuit until the 1970s. And uh, things things have changed, I think, for a lot of different reasons, largely because of that, cl- that, that clinical work that I mentioned, which is now 20 years in, in the case of psilocybin at the very least, um, and also with MDMA, the work of, of Rick Doblin at MAPS. He's been chugging away um, uh, at that as well. And so I, I just think that um, our biases, our prejudices are, are slowly melting away. Um, and certainly the work of Michael Pollan, the journalist, uh, d- d- did a great job with his book, How to Change Your Mind, and his, his, new, his new book, This Is Your Mind on Plants. I think the cultural conversation around psychedelics has changed dramatically in the past five years, and a lot of it is just dumb luck. Well, you mentioned William James, and there's two important aspects to James's career, which is overlooked in almost all the biographies that I've read. The first is that his formative experience was in the Amazon. He went to the Amazon with the biologist Louis Agassiz in 1865, and I think that certainly expanded his consciousness of, of human nature because he was working side by side with Afro-Brazilians, Portuguese military, rainforest Indians, and there's no indication that he ever took ayahuasca or any other mind-altering substances there. But a rich white kid whose idea of diversity was hanging out with other rich white kids <laughs> certainly had his world rocked by what he saw in the Amazon. The other thing about William James that's often overlooked is that William James actually took peyote. So peyote did not begin at Harvard with Schultes. It began with William James uh, 50 years earlier. But I have to point out that William James didn't like peyote. It didn't agree with him. It made him very sick. He much preferred nitrous oxide, right. laughing gas. That's what he writes about in the varieties, in, in right? In fact, William James wrote that it wasn't until I took nitrous oxide that I began to understand Hegel. Wow. Well, I did plenty of nitrous oxide in college, and I still don't understand <laughs> Hegel. So William James definitely had the jump on me there. <laughs> but I, I do agree with your, your timing, Brian, that, it, that the, the planets are in a line or, or shamanic magic happening that people are realizing. And that's why I like and, and chose to use that Back to the Future reference uh, in reference to your book, because we're rediscovering what the ancients knew and what indigenous peoples have been doing all along. The Comanche war chief, Quanna Parker, that I covered in the episode on peyote, said that uh, the, the, real, the reason that these indigenous religions and these syncretic religions, which combine things like Catholicism and, and indigenous belief systems, uh, has a grip uh, is that the, the white man goes into his church house and talks about Jesus, but the Indian takes peyote and goes into his church house and talks to Jesus. And this brings us back to the Eleusinian mysteries. And I want to ask you to address this this uh, thesis, this concept of your of the pagan continuity uh, idea, that you know we 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 tend to believe that well the Greeks invented Western civilization and then the Romans kind of took it over and then they kind of made a mess of it and Christianity rolled in and, and squished it. But in the Immortality Key, you make the point that those that Greek religious system, the Greek belief system, as personified by Eleusis, uh, may in fact indeed live on in, in Christianity and may indeed be the basis of, of all the so-called major religions. So please address that for us. So, yeah, I emphasize, I mean, the whole, a lot of the book is about psychedelics. Okay, let's be, let's be clear. But it's, it's not, that's not the key that I'm talking about in the immortality key. I, th- I think the key that I'm talking about and the thing that unites these pagan religions with early Christianity is the notion of experience, right? The direct experience of the divine. There were whole movements dedicated to this, several different sects um, within the Gnostic circles of early Christianity that were dedicated to the proposition that you have a spark of the divine inside you and that Jesus came not to be worshiped, but to, uh, to instruct all of us, men, women, and children, 
how to identify that spark, how to, how to fulfill our mission on earth, um, and how to embody that divinity, which is to say that we're all divine, okay? And, and this is the proposition of the mysteries that belong to the pagan world too, whether it's the mysteries of Eleusis that we talked about, the mysteries of Dionysus, which I think have far more in common with early Christianity, and we can talk about that later. Uh, but this, this, this notion of encountering the divine within through experience. So how did Aristotle uh, define this, the, this notion of the Eleusinian vision? So he said that you went to Eleusis not to, not to um, learn something. This is the Greek word mathain, like mathematics. You didn't go there to mathematically learn something like doctrine, dogma, the way we think of religion today. You went there to experience something, pathain. You went there to suffer pathos. You went there to actually experience something. Well, this shows up in early Christianity too. And the other thing that shows up in early Christianity are secrets. So just look at Mark 4.11. You know, Jesus talks in parables and tells these weird stories because there was an exoteric form to the faith and an esoteric version. Like the, there's no controversy among Christian scholars that Christianity is born with secrets. You have a, a church father like Tertullian in the second century who basically accuses the Gnostic Christians of imitating the pagan mysteries. There's this five-year um, you know, preparation process. They're trying to get these folks all excited about this great initiation. They're rising in the anxiety, anticipation. Um, he's basically making fun of them for, in fact, imitating the pagan mysteries. Um, and if you want to Google Dr. Martin Luther King, you can Google uh, the influence of the mystery religions on Christianity, an essay that even Dr. Martin Luther King himself wrote in 1950 about this notion of the continuity from that pagan pre-Christian world to what would become early Christianity in the decades and centuries after Jesus, before it became this big institution in the fourth century. So, you know, the thing that unites them is experience, this notion of secrets, magical practices, folks getting together to consume divine flesh and blood. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of parallels there. You know, the great Israeli ethnobotanist Benny Shannon said he did not understand how a man could talk to a burning bush until he went to Peru and took ayahuasca. Since then, Ayahuasca alkaloids have been found in the Sinai Desert. And in fact, at ESPD 55, a couple of months back, organized by Dennis McKenna, uh, a wonderful Iranian, a Persian scholar by the name of Shaheen, talked about Haoma as the basis of Zoroastrianism, which of course is the original Persian religion. So I think further research is beginning to reveal to us that these mystical experiences which seem to lie at the basis of essentially all religions, not just Christianity or, or, or Judaism or Islam, but some of these tribal religions are the people I've been working with. And this experience of the ineffable uh, could be part of everybody's experience and may in part explain what's missing from modern religion in the sense that the big question is, why are people turning away from organized religion? So what are your thoughts about the Eucharist that you cover in your book about how this may actually have been a, a mind-altering uh, drink at the outset? Okay, so you have to think about ancient wine, okay? So without, without being heretical or speculative about it, uh, ancient wine is very, very different from the wine we drink today. Um, in fact, uh, a common word used in ancient Greek, the language that was used to draft the Gospels, the language that was used by St. Paul, the greatest missionary Christianity ever knew when he was preaching and converting to the, this, this Hellenic universe around the Mediterranean, writing letters in Greek to Greek speakers. The word they use for wine is pharmakos, right? So the word they use is, is, is drug. So wine was routinely referred to as a drug from like the time of Homer to the fall of the Roman Empire. So over a thousand years go by. And of course, there's a word for wine, oinos, and you see that in the, in the New Testament. But this word uh, pharmakos pops up uh, as, as a ritual formula again and again. And the reason that is, is because wine at the time, and you see this in the ancient literature, uh, is uh, it's, it's described as you know, unusually intoxicating, seriously mind-altering, occasionally hallucinogenic, that's true, and potentially lethal, okay? So very, very different wine from the wine of today. And in fact, you can look at Dioscorides, right? The, the, great, the great physician who writes at, in the second half of the first century at the exact same time 
the Gospels are being written, and you can read recipe after recipe of what to add to wine to produce any number of different effects, whether it's adding spices like frankincense and myrrh, whether it's adding poisons, how did Socrates die in the end with wine spiked with hemlock, um, things like aconite, and then and then funky things like, like mandrake or henbane or black nightshade, which Dioscorides says can produce not unpleasant visions. Okay, so we have actual literature that points to something like a psychedelic vision in the first century AD at the time of the earliest Christians. So, you know, classic, classicists know this, like people who study Greek and Latin know this. Um, and what's weird is that the people who study the pagan world are often very different from uh, the priests and the pastors who study the New Testament from a very different angle. And this was pointed out by classicists in the early 20th century. And they go on to say things like, you know, how strange it is it is that like a, a very big part of the literature and civilization of the ancient world is very much neglected by the very ones best able to investigate it, which is to say uh, the Greek speakers and the, and the scholars. Um, and so w- just using that as, as like a big lens, um, you can then go in and, and find actual organic data, like you know physical proof that people were mixing things into wine. And I mentioned a few examples in the book, including from the first century at this Villa Vesuvio site outside Pompeii. They found actual traces of wine that seems to have been mixed with things like opium and cannabis and henbane and black nightshade, in addition to toads, frogs, and lizards. So some very funky wine actually did exist. One of the shortcomings of the ethnobotanical literature is, in my opinion, the failure to consider beer and wine not only as mind-altering substances, but as vehicles for making other mind-altering substances more mind-altering. In other words, they call them spirits for a reason. So this interplay of beer and wine, few people realize that wine is not just good because it's wine, but it's certainly in the ancient world, it was the number one antibiotic. Uh, And also it was used as a menstruum, a word not common in everyday parlance, but it's used for for dissolving these compounds. There's an episode in Plants of the Gods called Xing Herbs, Hexing Herbs, which focuses on these tropian alkaloids rich uh, plants like henbane Mm -hmm. that were used for uh, mind altering and religious and uh, which is Sabbath and all sorts of other interesting stuff like that. But explain to us your take on their role in the invention of civilization, uh, beer and wine, which are, I think are complementary. You know, it's been said that the first brewery may have been the first bakery, may have been the first temple, all at the same time. That's so it. elaborate on this beer theory for us. Without getting into too much detail, you're talking about Gobekli Tepe, which as far as we know goes back about 12,000 years from where we are now. Although some of these ritual elements that show up at this big megalithic site, 6,000 years, by the way, before Stonehenge, 7,000 years before the high civilizations that we know, like Egypt and and the Indus Valley and Sumeria, uh, there's this place, Gobekli Tepe, these giant um, megalithic T-shaped pillars that uh, the the uh, German archaeological folks, at the very least, think uh, were meant to represent some kind of deities. Um, and in this this big site in, in southeastern Turkey, um, you know, at, at the upper register of the Fertile Crescent, uh, 10th millennium, 9th millennium BC, they're finding these these big limestone vats, six of them. And they could accommodate, some of them, 42 gallons of liquid. Okay, 42 gallons of what? It wasn't water. Uh, It wasn't safe to drink water all the time, by the way. So they weren't necessarily looking to get intoxicated. But there's a great paper that came out, I think it was in 2012, um, about the ritual feasting. If you Google ritual feasting, Gobekli Tepe, German, and some some combination thereof, you'll find a great paper on um, the feasting that that they think took place there. Um, this, this ecstatic communion, these work parties that would bring people to this site where they, they weren't living there. They would come there, they think, for, for ritual purposes to commune with the dead, uh, potentially over something like a graveyard beer. So have we definitively found beer there? No, but the interesting traces um, of calcium oxalate beer stone, which do point to fermentation. And so it raises this big question, uh, did the agricultural revolution start with beer? In, in other words, did we, did we first start growing crops like, like wheat and barley uh, to bake bread? Or did we really start growing them to, to drink them, uh, to, to brew maybe one of these early ritual beers? The, you know, the jury's still out. It's a debate that goes back to the 1950s. But it does inform what would later happen at Eleusis and those many millennia in between. This notion of a graveyard beer, ecstatic communion, ritual events, there's some hint of Eleusis there, going all the way back 
to essentially the upper Paleolithic, which is kind of weird. Well, the question remains, was bread invented to make beer or was beer invented to make bread? (laughs) And in either case, it shows that beer was one of the building blocks of civilization. Yeah. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about our mutual colleague, Pat Patrick McGovern, whose work is really fundamental to sort of teasing this out. Yeah, at the University of of Pennsylvania. I consulted him when I was writing the book, and he put me in touch with a guy named Martin Zarnkow, uh, who did the testing for beer stone, by the way, at Gobekli Tepe, and has done some some follow-up experiments there, which are are really intriguing. Um, Pat McGovern is known, uh, amongst other things, for, for resurrecting some of these ancient potions and these ancient brews. Um, and he pointed me to like, um, well, the Midas Touch, for example, which, which he, he recreated. So that, that was based on a Phrygian potion, um, 8th century BC um, in Gordium. So this, this, this could be theoretically hearkening back uh, to King Midas. What, what, what they found in the burial chamber there was the remnants of a, of a funerary feast. And this is another theme that pops up again and, and again, especially in the Roman times into early Christianity. This notion of... Um, of a funeral banquet, uh, and there's even a word in Latin for this, uh, refrigerium, uh, which uh, means just like it sounds, it's a chill out, it's a refrigerator. Uh, so you see hints of that at this funeral banquet um, in, uh, with King Midas, and some of these, these, uh, these vessels contain the remnants of what McGovern identified as uh, calcium oxalate pointing to beer, tartaric acid pointing to wine, and potassium gluconate pointing to something like, uh, like honey or mead. So some sort of weird you know, beer, wine, mead concoction uh, that was used, as he says, to, to royally usher the king into the afterlife and maybe those attending uh, this this funeral banquet. So um, again, there there is actual you know organic chemical data pointing to the existence of these potions, these compounds for centuries and centuries before Christianity. Well, this brings up two interesting complementary or competitive theories, depending on your perspective. One is the stoned ape theory, <laughs> which is that. Uh, these monkeys were going down to the ground or these proto-simians, whatever they were, and eating ripe fruit because the the fruit that had fallen was the ripest and they're the sweetest, but it also start to ferment. So they were uh, catching a buzz from that. And the other is that it was the drunk monkey theory, that it was uh, a similar mind-altering that, that got them started. And, and uh, the late Terence McKenna that you and I both discussed in our writings had this idea that it was this alter, alteration of consciousness which gave birth to the human uh, brain expansion, ultimately humans, human culture, and everything else. So do you see those as, 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 as different theories or complementary? Is it really one or the other? Or is it really all of these different mind-altering aspects throughout the course of not only human evolution but pre-human evolution got us to where we are today? I think they're very complementary. The, the, the same with these potions that... Uh, that you rightly suggest, the, the idea of alcohol as a vehicle for these other compounds. Um, I got that idea from Terence McKenna. He mentions it in one page of Food of the Gods. And it was this notion of these, these archaic, um, matriarchal, psychedelic-loving societies versus the later patriarchal alcohol lovers. And uh, uh, he mentions the, the, this notion that you know, alcohol could have been uh, this intermediary that, that really united the two. Um, so, so spiked beer, spiked wine. So I think, you know, the, the, the drunken monkey isn't that controversial. The stoned ape is far more controversial for reasons you can imagine. But it's worth looking into. This morning, as a matter of fact, I won't mention details, but I was talking to my friend Lee Berger, who is a paleoanthropologist in South Africa. And together we're taking like a very serious look uh, at, at being able to scientifically test some of these stoned ape ideas. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please remember to give us a good rating and to subscribe and share with like-minded folks. We appreciate your support for the protection of the knowledge and biodiversity of South America by the Amazon Conservation Team. In our next episode, join us for part two of this thought-provoking discussion with Dr. Plotkin and Brian Morescu as we delve more deeply into the role psychedelics have played in Western civilization.